Hey guys, Alex from Fast Fitness Tips here. If like me, you're suffering from TWS, Tor Withdrawal Syndrome, I've put together a little video that you can watch that actually is a nice reminder of last year's tour. Can you remember anything about the 2018 tour now we think about it? Or is 2019 still in your mind? Sure, 2019 was amazing. Alaphilippe certainly lit up numerous stages. We had Thomas de Ghent attack, attacking nearly every stage, it seemed. We had uh, an amazing time trial. Wood van Ert crashing out, unfortunately. Apparently he's okay, but he's got a long road to recovery. Amazing effort by Pino, but dying at the last. Alaphilippe almost winning the tour, but just being beaten, really, on the last two stages. And... Martin and Roe kicked out of the race for like handbags at dawn issue on the bike. Somewhat funny but sad at the same time. Yeah, it was an amazing tour. But here's my reminder then of the 2018 tour. And I've got a topic of the day. And the topic is, why is it the sprinters find it so hard to get over the climbs? And why is it the sprinters are in danger of falling outside of the time cut? on every climbing stage. Okay, does it sound obvious to you? Let's look at it fast fitness tip style with a bit of science. Here it goes guys. So here we are a few days after Garen Thomas's stolen victory on the 2018 Tour de France. And I wanna ask you guys a key question. That is, why do sprinters struggle to climb? In particular, what is the science behind this? Now, if you have a chance, watch again stage 11 of the tour because it was the 108 kilometer stage from Albertville to La Rosier. In a way, this was a key stage in this year's tour because it was the one where Garen Thomas went ahead of all his competitors, including Froome. Although I must say, the rate that the Sky Train went up that mountain, the third mountain, the third climb, was just unbelievable. But Garen Thomas finished that whole stage in three and a half hours at an average speed of 31 kilometers an hour. Now, here's what happened. So many riders went off the back and failed to meet the time cut. It's a complicated algorithm, by the way, what determines the exact time cut. But basically, they had to come in within half an hour that a number of headline riders were thrown out of the tour on stage 11. Now, exactly the same thing happened again on stage 12 to Alp Duez. So we actually lost Mark Cavendish, who finished an hour behind Thomas. We lost Mark Renshaw. We lost Marcel Kittel. And on stage 12, also either failing on the time cut or giving up because they knew they were so far behind. Andre Greipel, Fernando Gaviria, Dylan Gronewegen, Marcel Seberg, Rick Zabel, Tony Gallopan, you know, the list goes on. So here's a question for you guys. How tough is it for a sprinter to make a climb that these guys are expected to do? How much harder is it? And what is it that differentiates the sprinter from the climber? Or indeed the climber from the sprinter? Now this phenomenon of the sprinter being so far behind that they're almost eliminated was really captured beautifully on the 2016 stage 15 of the Vuelta, a very similar stage to the one I'm talking about today. 118 kilometers, ridden at a very fast pace with Nairo Quintana competing with Contador and Froome on the day. He averaged 40.7 kilometers an hour with a two hour 45 finish. Riders had to come within 31 minutes of that. Unbelievably, 93 riders, the majority of the riders in the peloton failed to make the time cut on that day and were threatened with being thrown out of the Vuelta. In other words, the Vuelta would have lost half the peloton in one stage. Now, obviously, the tour organizers said, whoa, 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 we can't have this. We're gonna, we're gonna readmit those riders that would otherwise be thrown out because they have discretion to do what they want. But it crystallizes for me this issue of the difference between a sprinter and a climber at the climb. So what do you think is the real difference? Now, I've heard various speculations about the difference between sprinters and climbers or sprinters and in kind of more endurance-based athlete. For example, that they have a difference in ratio of fast or slow twitch muscle fibers or, you know, varying from, let's say, 50-50 to, let's say, 80-20 or 70-30. But 
I've not actually ever seen a biopsy study of this. Although these days you can get a genetic testing which gives you propensity to your muscle type. I don't know how accurate this is. I'm just saying it's available. But the one factor we do know, which is incontrovertible, unarguable if you like, is the weight of the rider and more specifically the watts per kilo because that's what's going to propel you over the hills when, when so much of the effort is coming to fight against gravity. And just to prove my point, if you head over to gribble.org and look at the cycling power versus speed graphical calculator, let's say you put in 0.5% for grade of the hill. If you're going pretty slow, slower than the pro athletes and world tour athletes do up the hill, I'm talking about a speed of, let's say, 16 kilometers an hour. Then on the chart, you'll see that at 16 kilometers an hour for these typical parameters on the right hand side, a third of your losses are coming from gravity, a third are coming from rolling resistance, and a third are coming from aero drag. Above that speed, 16 kilometers an hour, then more is coming from aero drag. And above that gradient, 0.5, look how low that is. Above that gradient at a modest speed, then more is coming from fighting against gravity. So clearly the watts per kilo is gonna be important going uphill, but just how important is it? That's what we wanna look at today. Now, as it happens, the heights, weights, and BMI of the World Tour riders are pretty much in the public domain. Well, approximately. It doesn't tell you exactly what they are today or during the race. But if you look at this chart here, you'll see that the, you'll see that the climbers are very light, generally under 70 kilos. And the sprinters are generally a little bit heavier, or to be a bit more precise about it in terms of BMI. The climbers tend to have a BMI of, let's say, under 21, often under 20, whereas the sprinters have a BMI above 21, like Marcel Kittel here, 82 kilograms, 188 centimeters, BMI 23. Vincenzo Nibali, 65 kilos, 181 centimeters in height, BMI 19.8. In fact, Pro Cycling Stats has done a little survey of the top 25 GC riders and found that on average, sprinters are around 71.7 kilos, whereas climbers are 64.2 kilos. And sprinters tend to be a little bit taller, 178 centimeters on average. That's around 5 foot, 11 and a half or so. So now what we can do based on that information is we can plug this into a calculator, several of which are online, but I think the most accurate one now is the Cycling App's Virtual Wind Tunnel app, which is coming out pretty soon. Yes, a declaration here, we have helped Cycling Apps work on their algorithm and perfect this model. And I don't mind saying, in my opinion, this is the only one that has full inclusion of uh, road tire type, wheel choice, equipment choice in terms of frame, position on the bike, rider biometrics, in other words, height, weight, etc. But not just that, environmental conditions, and then it takes into account, obviously gravity, obviously aero drag, obviously drivetrain friction, rolling resistance, and something that very rarely is accounted for elsewhere mathematically. And that is not just the translational drag, but the rotational drag of the wheel choice, for example. So it builds all that into the model and it's, it is complicated because it depends on the weight of the rider, it depends on the environmental conditions, the temperature, the outside air pressure, all these kind of things are taken into account, even whether the rider is drafting or riding solo. And it produces a final model of losses or perhaps more usefully, a prediction. If you put in the, feed in the numbers, it will give you the prediction of the power of the rider, pretty accurate prediction of the power needed for that particular combination of circumstances. So what we can do is then plug the known details for a climber versus a sprinter, and let's take stage 11 of Tour de France. Just to recap then, have a look at this diagram here. This is the profile of the stage. 108 kilometers, three, possibly three and a half climbs. Monte de Bizzani, which is 12.5 kilometers at 8.2%. You were called Dupree, 12.6 kilometers, 7.6%. The Roseland climb, 5.7 kilometers, 6.5%. And La Rosière itself, 17.6 kilometers of 5.8%. Now, we can average those all out, and it turns out if you if you just simply mathematically average those climbs, it is around 7% gradient. If you were to just ride those climbs, you could consider the bits between the climbs, you know, recovery essentially. 
Or an alternative is to draw a line from the start of the stage to the top of the mountain at the end and say, well, it's 108 over a constant gradient of around you know, 2 2.5 percent that will get you to the top of the last climb okay enough preamble what do we actually find well the first interesting fact is if you take Gara and thomas winning time 3.5 hours 31 kph if you look at a cda around 0.278 and a gradient for the stage around 2.5 percent gives him a watts of about 318 for the stage or around that would translate into an ftp around 385 also, it would tell you that he could do probably around 440 for a 20 minute flat out effort. Bear in mind, this is in the in the middle, well, you know, stage 11 of the tour. So he's not super fresh at that point necessarily. Now, I'm basing his weight here on 70 kilos, but actually Team Sky have come out and said that his weight pre-tour was around 67, 68. And I wouldn't be surprised if it went down at least half a kilo during the initial weeks of the tour as well. So, you know, in terms of Thomas being a climber, he actually could have a BMI in the 19s with a body weight of around 67 and a height of 183. So what does the model show? Well, if we use the constant grade model, that's 2.5% over the whole of the race, then it predicts that his watts would be 337.6 or around 4.8 watts per kilo over the stage Although I just mentioned it could easily be 5 watts per kilo if his weight dropped to 67 kilos. And if we use that 7%, you know, triple climb amalgamation model, 7% over 48 kilometers of climbing, uh, that would leave 60 kilometers of not climbing, roughly, you know, 75 kph, roughly 75 kph over 60 kilometers of not climbing, mostly downhill, of course which would mean that the uphill was done at roughly 18 kph. An 18 kph uphill 7% gives me a ballpark figure around 318 watts for Thomas. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Let's repeat that but plug in the data for Kittle, 188 centimeters, 82 kilos, and for that 7% grade, 18 kph he would need to be outputting 362 watts and for the 2.5 constant grade model at 31 kph to, to keep up with thomas precisely he would need to output 368 watts now it's true of course if either of them hit in the peloton particularly second place or backwards that would be much reduced in fact if Kittle was at the back of the peloton just hanging on, but nevertheless, within a close distance, you know, let's say half a meter of the back rider, still in the peloton, not off the back, then that could be reduced to around 257. Providing he doesn't substantially drop below 257 watts, he would hang on at the back of the peloton, and providing the peloton itself doesn't, you know, lose contact substantially with the, with the lead bunch, he should be okay. But there is another problem here, which is Kittle's body shape is, of course, not the same as Thomas, Nibali, Quintana. You know, the climber's body shape is different. It's not just their watts per kilo. So their aerodynamics is different. That's why it gets a little bit complicated. However, the cycling app's virtual wind tunnel app will take this into account. So you can put their body biometrics into the calculator and it will tell you. So just very quickly, if I do this with Kittle, then it's telling me based on his body shape, that roughly his required watts is around 360, 355 to 360. Compare that to Thomas and it would be 310 to 320. And so here's an interesting one, Quintana, based on his body profile and position on the bike, he would only need to output to keep up with the rider's time, Thomas's time, of around 270 to 280 watts. Well, I say only, obviously in watts per kilo, that's almost exactly equivalent, 4.6, 4.7 watts per kilo so hopefully this scientific analysis based on the virtual wind tunnel from cycling apps but you can use a number of other online calculators yourself if you want to check these figures will give you a bit of a heads up why it's so difficult for the sprinter to get over those big climbs and why those riders are ejected from the back and potentially face that horrendous time cut dilemma now to bring this home a bit more, Vegan Cyclist recently posted an awesome video of himself versus one of his buddies who's a basically a track sprinter. And we can also put those data into the model and find out whether there's a appreciable difference. And sure enough, if you put in Vegan Cyclist stats 
178 centimeters, 70.5 kilos versus track sprinter, 175 centimeters, 83.9 kilos. They did a six mile race. I think it was an 800 meter ascent. Vegan cyclists did it in 31.6 kph, I think it was. Track sprinter did it in 24 kph. I work out the Tyler would have needed 256 watts to complete that climb, but the track sprinter, his body weight, would have needed 433 to go at vegan cycling speed. But he actually did it in around 300 watts by my calculation, which is a pretty decent effort. So let's say you normalized their power and gave them both 350 watts to play with so that they both went up the climb in 350 watts. Then the difference in their CDA, i.e. aerodynamics, and also their watts per kilo, would mean that Tyler would go up the climb in around um, 32 and a half minutes whereas track sprinter would go up there in around 35 to 35 and a half or around two and a half to three minutes difference if they were able to ride at the same power. So just to mention guys this is all assuming that they have the same equipment, same wheels, ride in the same condition, same day basically and heading off at the same time with the same motivation. If the riders lack motivation, and this is a key thing, let's say you're a sprinter, you're struggling to keep up, you know you need to produce a big power, actually a bigger power number than your climber equivalent, you're struggling to hold on, you're in the bunch, you, you know, gradually, gradually transition to the back of the bunch and then you fall off the back. This is why it gets into a no-win situation because the climber is still in the bunch, albeit probably at the front. They're getting some aero advantage of being at the front. For example, somebody needing 362 watts to go up the climb solo would need 337 to go up the climb in the pro peloton in second place. So like, you know, the optimum team lead position just behind their super domestique. So that's my take on the difference between a sprinter and a climber and why it's so difficult for a sprinter to crest those unbelievably high mountains in the Pyrenees or Alps. Let me know if you have any thoughts on the differences between sprinters and climbers. Like, are there any fundamental physiological differences between the two? Has anything been proven in science other than the difference in weight, which I'm really demonstrating here? All right, guys, thanks for supporting Fast Fitness Tips. We appreciate your input. And until next time, have a great ride.